preguntas y ver hasta qué punto puedo, puedo responder alguna de esas preguntas. Eh, espero que lo disfruten y, y, y bueno, eh, eh, más que todo, eh, dirigido hacia profesionales de, de la medicina, cirugía plástica y otorrinolaringología, pero voy a tratar en la medida de lo posible de ser lo más, lo más explicativo. Eh, por favor, les agradezco, o sea, temas de precios, eso, eso no es lo que estamos hablando acá, ¿ok? Estamos hablando de técnica, frente. Bueno, ahorita me voy a cambiar inglés. Well, Dr. Cameron, I don't know if you understand Spanish at all. But we have, uh, yeah, we, we, we have like online watching us, mostly Spanish speaking people. So I was just telling them about not asking prices, that it was going to be more, more like a lecture. Okay, very professional, speaking about primary rhinoplasty. But still, um, I'm going to try to make it a little bit more dynamic for them. And if I see any questions that I can answer, maybe I can stop if you're okay with the time. And um, we can answer interesting stuff. I don't know what you, you think about it. 100%. 100% correct. Okay. So, do you want to mute your Instagram just for the time being? Well, if I mute Instagram... They, they won't be able to listen to me or to the lectures. Oh, of course, of course, 100%. Okay, you guys happy with the, with the sound? I think not. Maybe I can put down a little bit in volume on my microphone, maybe. How about that? Is that better? That sounds better, eh? How about that? Is it even better? So let me just see if I put mine on here. Okay, how's that, guys? Can you hear something? Is that better? Much better. Okay. Okay. If it really gets bad, try putting your microphone out in your Instagram live. If they won't hear me, but that's that's okay. Then they can't hear me on Instagram live. Just just for a little while. There you go. Okay. Is that better? Jonathan, you're out saying that there's an echo. How do we take rid get rid of that echo, Jonathan? Okay, guys, so I'm going to just switch, switch my camera on. Yep, I mean, there's a lot of feedback. Okay, let's just figure out how we can do this. Um, so is it better now? Now, I'm going to see if I can just... I'm trying to just see if I can turn things off from my side. So or if I can maybe use my AirPods as well. And that, is that going to be better? That's cool. Okay. No. Yeah, I think his side's going to be there. We'll see now. Okay. okay. How about now? Is it better? Sounds much better to me. You guys happy with that? So Can are you, you able to listen to me in the computer and also in the cell phone? Hundred percent. Okay. Okay. Perfect. There we go. Okay. So guys, um, we're doing two things. We've got Instagram live going on this side. I'll turn the screen just now when Furlan's going to be sharing his screen, but let's kick this off. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. Uh, we are in the month of, what is it now, September. It's the last month of season two of the Rhinoplasty Podcast. We've been going for eight months, and this month is enabled by Gal Derma. So, a huge shout out to Gal Derma. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. It's broadcast in over 70 countries around the world. Unfortunately, I'm in English, so I have to learn my Spanish. And this month, uh, the theme is Hola from South America. And it's absolutely a huge privilege for me to invite one of the most dynamic young rhinoplasty surgeons in the world, all the way from Venezuela, from Caracas, Dr. Ferlan Paez. Ferlan, thank you so much for being on the show today. 
Dr. Cameron, uh, for me, it's a pleasure. It, it's actually, I think, the place I've, uh, the farthest place I've ever been giving lectures to. I've given a lecture to Australia, but to get to Australia, it's even faster than getting to South Africa. So thank you so much. Thank you for giving me your time and thank you for organizing everything. Oh, it's awesome, man. So, so we're going to get into quite a few things today. It's, it's um, before we like to kick this whole thing off, starting off. So, why did I invite you to come on this show? I was one of the American guys, um, Paul Fries was in Miami, and Paul and I were chatting and sitting. Cam, dude, you've got to get hold of this Freeland guy. It's just insane when you see his results on Instagram. So uh, we've been trying this for a while, but now finally I've gotten hold of you. So the first question I have for the listeners around the world, just tell us your story. How did you start and get into, into facial plastic surgery and rhinoplasty and stuff? People love to hear how it all starts. Well, Dr. Cameron, as you know, I'm an ENT. So my basis was based in, uh, in ear, nose and throat surgery in my residency. Okay, and I first started out uh, wanting to do autology, uh, neurotology. I love that. I went to Switzerland with Hugo Fish, and now I went to Italy with Mario Sana. You must have heard about them. Yeah, and um, training for ear surgery, I came back to Venezuela, and actually the situation in Venezuela was very catastrophic, politically speaking. And as you know, ear surgery is something more um, hospital-based practice. So I started doing for the first year that um, autology um, uh, practice, but I really didn't feel that good personally, okay? So a good thing was uh, going on um, besides me or next to me is that um, my mother had her and she was trained in uh, rhinoplasty in Mexico, okay? You know, Mexico is very, very uh, into rhinoplasties and they do lots, lots and lots of rhinoplasty. They have a lot of professors, a lot of uh, lecturers all around the world doing that. So she told me, you know what? Why don't you um, do something in rhinoplasty and just to back you up and do, to do something else? And with the Venezuelan Society of Facial Plastic Surgery, they sent me to Oregon, to Portland, with the Dr. Tom Wong, and yes. I, I, I could, you know, thank this guy for uh, opening my eyes. He was the former, actually in that moment, he was the president of the International Federation of Facial Plastic Surgery, and he took me everywhere, uh, lectures, practices, he taught me everything I know all the way until now. So that's where it all started, okay? I think I should oh, um, and uh, thank also Tom Wong, okay? He was very reconstructive. He did a lot of most reconstructions. He was doing a lot of cleft palates and that got me into reconstructions. So, you know, uh, being a rhinoplasty surgeon, primary rhinoplasties make you, you know, known in between patients, but secondary rhinoplasties get you known in between uh, colleagues, okay, and professionals. Yeah. So basing my practice in secondary rhinoplasties got me all the way here. All the way here to you. It's amazing, man. So tell me, if we take a step away from uh, this rhinoplasty journey, you're also a very committed family man. You know, um, you've got two beautiful children and a beautiful wife. How do you get balance in your life where you running this intense practice, doing a lot of teaching, traveling, which I want to chat to you about just now as well, but also committed to your family? It's been with me since uh, I was 20. So she's been all around my uh, doing medical school and uh, everything about ENT. All my struggling in between ear surgery and nose surgery. So she's very committed uh, to me. She she's very comprehensive. She she sometimes says, and, uh, too much time for uh, to your spouse. She balances everything. Um, she helps me a lot with the kids. And she makes them understand, well, not the little guy with the one, she's, he's only one year old, but the three-year-old, almost four-year-old is, you know, starting to wake up and starting to say, hey, dad, come on, I want to spend more time with you. So I'm, I'm feeling more about organizing myself next year because, yes, I, I, I'm very committed, but still, I think I, I should uh, give more time to them. No, it's, that's true. Eh? Um, I'm very glad you didn't do autology, my friend, because... Um, yeah, it's never really interested me from an ENT side of things. Tell me, tell us now, how do you manage? As I understand, once a week you actually go to Colombia and you operate there. Yeah, I'm doing a one week a month in Colombia. Okay. 
we were having trouble with the migration process here to Venezuela. Okay, Venezuela was asking too many requirements for patients to come here and have surgery, visas, uh, exemptions. Um, actually, patients like more the idea of going down to Bogota. Bogota is a place to go. I think it's before I was doing this uh, surgery stuff. Um, I think it was my favorite city somehow. So, um, yeah, Colombia is great. And actually for students as well, it's great. I've managed to make a hands-on course. I'm giving while I do surgery down there. And it was great. It's, it's lovely. I'm planning on doing that next year as well. Not every month, but every two months to take care more about my family. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. but still, it's gonna be something I'm gonna do for a long time. That's awesome, man. Okay, so tell me, what do you do to, when you're not doing rhinoplasty? Well, I, I'm not, I don't have a very low handicap, but I still do it. Uh, <laughs> I don't have the time to take the handicap very low, but still. And uh, that's it, family, golf, and uh, traveling around. We, side by side with the traveling, I do a lot of tourism. I like going to fine restaurants, having a great bottle of wine, and you know, taking these conferences, invitations uh, makes me, you know, go around the world doing that tourism. I love. Yeah. So, so you've been speaking a lot about the influence the Americans and North America has had on you, and uh, a lot of that is also on the structural rhinoplasty side of things, which you're going to chat about. But then I know it's just also on, there are some really heavy hitting Europeans, especially some of the Turkish guys that have big influence on your career as well. Well, that's that's great. You know, now that you say that, um, I was just last week with um, this Turkish structure. Uh, we're used to listening, well, here in Latin America, about uh, Turkey being only preservation. But actually, uh, I was um, with Sureya. Uh, this guy that was, you know, like the father of every single structural guy in Turkey. And he would say, yeah. you know what, a structure was first in Turkey and then came out preservation. I, yeah. I went to Body Shock here last year to see preservation. I w didn't want to do preservation, but I know preservation had a lot of advantages over structural rhinoplasty. And I wanted to see that. But after seeing um, thick skin managing and how in Turkey they do that a lot, and I just went there and I was amazed. You know, whenever you feel that you realize everything and you get to someone and he makes you understand that you don't know anything at all. So that, that just happened to me two weeks ago. And it was amazing because I had the opportunity to learn a lot, to share a lot. Okay, I have to thank Sureya Senaldir, I have to thank Emre Ilham, uh, Hussein Baliki, I have to thank all the three guys that, that taught me everything they know and received me as I was, you know, just my colleague and someone to share information with. Yeah, that's cool, man. So we were talking off air about what you want to chat about in terms of moving a little bit more into technical stuff. So for the listeners out there, this is where it gets a little bit more technical for not so much for patients and people want to know about it, the, your background, but... Maybe you want to try and share your screen now. I'm going to change the Instagram uh, camera so that the, the uh, watchers can see what you're speaking about. But do you want to try and share your screen for that PowerPoint you want to chat about? So, guys, we really want to kind of climb into, into um, primary rhinoplasty because by far that we've seen on, on the 50 or so programs of the podcast, people are interested in primary rhinoplasty. So... Uh, Are there any questions, by the way, that you want to? Volume anyone came wants up. To answer? Volume came up a little bit. Or, uh, to take it. Okay, so are you guys seeing my screen? Yeah. Let me turn this. Around. I can see your screen perfectly, and I'm gonna turn this around. Is that your family photos? Let's see, let's see if we can go. see this. There, there, there we go. go. Got it. That's perfect. That's perfect. Happy with that, Jay? Eh? Okay. Brother Dr. Cameron, uh, as I was saying uh, before uh, we got on, I didn't want to talk to you about just regular rhinoplasty or traditional rhinoplasty. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, what I do different by now, okay? As I was saying, Sureya, as I was saying, um, all the lecturers around the world, 
there's this kind of um i call it somehow godfather that he knows a lot about all the literature he, his name is arturo regalado from mexico i have a special uh, commitment to him because he has taught me you know step by step um whenever i try to do something new he's always there to say you know for land that is not new someone did it before someone got it there before so that's great so um, filtering everything I do and seeing this is something really no one does. Um, I'm going to talk to you about those four. I do different. Okay. As you were saying, I'm mostly um, uh, structural uh, rhinoplasty surgeon. I do do any kind of preservation. It is not that I don't like preservation. I, I know there's a lot of um, patients that require or are more benefited somehow in preservation. But still, it's a learning cure. I'm still not prepared to give my patients. So I feel comfortable with structural. It works for primary, it works for uh, secondary. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, Dr. Cameron, please feel free to, to, to interrupt me with questions. OK, the first topic is kind of um, very interesting. It's called dominant mm -hmm. cephalometry. Uh, I was having a lot of uh, problems with crew gnosis. And I was just wondering why, if I was following the theory, I was getting those kind of results, okay? Doing septal extender grafts, doing all the osteotomies and doing everything we know so far. So that's a kind of cool topic to talk about. Then my own way of giving definition to the dorsal aesthetic lines, as you know, we can we know how to manage to thin the dorsal aesthetic lines to get them bigger, but no one is talking about how to make them more defined. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm using kind of a new septal extender graft, okay? You know, septal extender graft is very discussed because if you put it lateral, it could crook your nose. If you put a terminal, it could have support. So everybody's talking about that as well. I have a kind of a special way of making it. And I'm talking about uh, the shield graft, sheen graft, okay? I know a lot of people don't use it. They say in thin skin it shouldn't be used. So I kind of have a special why I use it in almost all my patients. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Okay. Um, so regarding the first topic, dominant cephalometry. So dominant cephalometry is all about prognosis. Okay. A lot of my patients, revision rhinoplasties, come from other surgeons saying, and my nose is crooked, so I do cephalometry, the traditional cephalometry, and whenever I take the midline in between the eyes with the midline in between the lips, actually the nose the patient is having is communicating perfectly those two dots, but still the nose looks crooked. So I was wondering why is this happening and why is this also happening to me? So I, I went out to Google. Okay, and whenever you hit cephalometry in Google in the search engine, you find this scale. Okay, so just the first one I found. Okay, and I was starting to look very closely to this um, scale, to this picture, and I realized even in the picture, the nose was not completely straight. Okay, and the line connecting the two dots in between the eyes and in between the lips was not completely straight. So I started wondering what's going on. Okay, there's two lines. There's a vertical line going through the mid part of your eyes, and there is a vertical line going through the mid part of the lips. And not in all patients, those lines come together. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whenever yeah. those lines don't come together, you're going to have a crooked nose. So you have to plan out something else. People don't want a nose connecting an asymmetrical face. They just want a vertical line in their noses. That vertical line is making out two symmetrical oblique views. And that vertical line is also making a very symmetrical face view. Okay. I'm starting to planify, or I'm starting to plan, sorry, my patients in those two lines. So um, how do I plan that out? Look at this case. This is a very representative case. You yeah. see, it was a nose crooked to the left. You see, she had very asymmetrical nostrils. Everything was asymmetrical, and it turned out really good. It's not perfect, but it's really good. But if you look up closely, you're going to see that her nose is very symmetrical, but the whole nose is closer to the right eye than to the left eye. 
Yes, 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 okay. So if I try to move that upper third to the midline in between the her eyes, I was ending up in a crooked nose, wasn't I? Yes, yes. Everything about dominant cephalometry. What are you doing? Which is the best case scenario? Are you using mid part of the eyes, mid part of the lips, or even those patients, those two lines encounter each other, then you can have a textbook result whenever you communicate both lines. Particularly, I use the midline in the lips. You see the midline is closer to the right eye than to the left eye, and still it looks very, very straight, okay? Same thing happens in the base view. You see how crooked she was. I put her completely straight, but being straight makes her closer to the right eye than to the left eye. That's amazing. Isn't it fascinating? So do you, I use vector morphing with patients and every single time I will put their right and their left sides and stitch those together to show them how asymmetric the face can be at times because it's so hard to explain to a patient that we're going to try and straighten the nose, but are you straightening according to the eyes or according to the lips? That's it. So I invite you, instead of doing uh, vector modeling, I was as well, I invite you to do traditional cephalometry and just trace a line in between the eyes, trace a line in the middle of the lips, and whenever they don't match, you can tell the patients, you see how these two lines don't match, yeah. how asymmetrical your face is, and how difficult it's going to be for me to make a straight nose. So whenever I started using this, uh, Dr. Cameron, it is amazing how patients understand what I'm saying, you know? They, yeah. uh, they, they understand the asymmetries in the face. They understand how those asymmetries are completely, completely um, um, somehow bonded to how straight or how crooked the nose can be and how difficult it is to make it straighter and to make them feel, of course, um, uh, graded or make them feel comfortable with the nose they get. I, I, I don't know if you get what I'm saying. I know it's not that easy to get, but, I, but I'm still, you know, filtering the explanation to make it more comprehensive. Yeah, of course. So that's one thing I do, okay? I do cephalometry in every single patient of mine. That's what I use for my pre-op consultations, okay? I take the pictures. I do the lines, these lines you're seeing. And after that, I take the patient in the office and start explaining all about not only symmetries in face or not only crooked nose but also everything we know okay how are we going to do the dorsal aesthetic lines how the inner width should be how high or low the rotation of the tip should be but we all know about that okay and it's the same explanations all rhinoplastic surgeons do so i think this is the only thing different i'm doing in the pre-op consultation okay so being that said okay and seeing the profile view in this patient then i'm going to talk a little bit about um not only making the dorsal aesthetic lines thinner or thicker, okay, that's something we know should be known every single patient, but how uh, how am I going to give definition to those dorsal aesthetic lines? So the thing is, very interested thing that it is that no one is talking about that, okay? Oh, another interesting thing is that, as you know, dorsal pressure make the makes the dorsal aesthetic lines wider okay so i was talking to jose carlos neves from portugal and he was saying you know what Fernand, i've been starting to think about what you're doing but in preservation as well so it's very interesting it applies to structural rhinoplasty and also applies to preservation rhinoplasty so i have for that a very 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 nice simulation so um look at this simulation okay you're going to see, sorry for the music. You're going to see the internal valve. I'm going to make a very, very small groove. I'm not going to cut the cartilage, only a groove, okay? In that internal valve, in that upper lap cartilage, okay? That groove is going to allow me to flex the lateral wall, okay? After that, I use a piezotome and I do a parametral osteotomy. And after that, I do the lateral osteotomy as we know it. If I take this video back a little bit, you're going to see how it goes, okay? And you're going to see how my dorsum is still intact, so you can make a letdown or a pushdown while doing this, okay? But the lateral wall, it's completely...
completely collapsing, okay? So I'm leaving intact all the functional valvular aspect, okay? I'm keeping intact that measure that we should have in the internal valve that should be, as Toriumi says, eight millimeters at least. I'm keeping all the definition in the upper third and in the lower third, but I, when the lateral wall collapses, gives more definition. It's exactly the same explanation as doing tip definition. As resting angle, we could call, okay? We could say it's kind of a resting right. angle, but for right. the lateral wall. So um, I don't know if you get the idea, but I'm starting to use this, okay, in patients that bring a very wide dorsum. And as you see results, you can see this kind of patients, okay? So if you see a hump or dorsal hump in these kind of patients, you could think about dorsal preservation, don't you? Because she has nice dorsal aesthetic lines, they're very straight, um, they're very natural, but this patient, this patient in, in, in specifically was not asking for that. She was asking for more definitions. She was saying, you know what? My dorsum is not defined. I have no contours at all. So this is a result when doing only paramedial and lateral osteotomies and doing that little groove in the internal wall. You see how I keep the same alignment. I do better tip definition. We can do that with tip grafting, tip sutures, or whatever. But I also give contour definition, dorsal aesthetic line definition. So she not only gets a frontal view with a very nice nose, and of course, the base view, side view, and complete profile view. So I, I, I don't know if you if you if you feel like something it's going on different from what you heard about in textbooks and what you have been hearing about preservation of rhinoplasty, that everyone is talking about hump reduction, everybody's talking about crooked noses, but no one is talking about um, dorsal definition. And Dr. Cameron, I could tell you, I've been doing this for the last five years, and uh, there's no complaint about a too defined dorsum. Yes, there is complaint about too defined tips. But no one complains about having a dorsal steady line, very well defined, very straight, okay? And girls are even saying, you know what, doctor, I don't even need makeup anymore, okay? Uh, I'm giving that makeup result with your surgery. So that's something I'm doing different nowadays as well. Yeah. So uh, talk to me about that, the cut that you do on the upper laterals. How, how do you actually do you use piezo to just slightly shave that? Or do you use a blade? So, so, so you see the instrument I'm using, that's interesting. That's a great question you just asked, okay? Because look at the instrument I'm using. So that's another thing I'm doing new, okay? And and the interest the instrument I'm using, I didn't bring it to this conference, but I, I, I'll share you a slide, is a bovi. It's a cautery. So I put my bovi in just 10 to 15, okay, power. I use only the cut, okay? So that makes me control the depth of the cut I'm doing in the upper lat, in the upper lat, yeah. So I was trying to do this with a knife, with a chisel. I couldn't control the depth, okay? I didn't know how far am I, am I going into the cartilage. People usually ask me about how about chondrocytes, how about uh, the maintenance of that cartilage? in the future and you know what i'm saying maybe in in grafting okay kobobi uh, is not that nice i've had revisions of my own and i've seen grafting intact after using the bobi but upper lats and lower lats are cartilage that have their own um vascular um, you know mattress that always gives them a very good healing and always gives them a very outcome after using bobi and using the bobi in a very small power Okay, it gives you the control to make that small groove as if I was doing a part of medial osotomy, but in the upper left. I'm going to show you a photo, okay, of how it looks after I finish the presentation and how I use the bovi to do that. Um, you know what? I'm going to do it right away. Hold on a second. Let me go here to Valplasti. I have the lecture right here. I just came from Colombia giving this lecture. So I'm gonna show you how that um, how that uh, wedge looks like, okay? So it's kind of a video, and you see how I'm using a not protected uh, bovi teeth, and just I just do those, you know, lateral uh, grooves, small grooves, all over the upper lats, and you see how I can measure the distance in between the grooves, and that distance yeah. it's only eight millimeters, as Toriumi says. So I'm keeping valve intact. I'm not going all the way through the cartilage. I'm not touching the internal mucosa. 
and but I'm giving definition to those um, dorsums that were very wide over eight millimeters. You see it now? Yes, it's very. So this is the little tricks you're showing us here. I love it, eh? It's it's a tip. It's exactly. It's just a tip. It's, it's things I've, I've never seen before that I've been using for a long time. Okay, and it's been working for me a lot, a lot of like. So people are not having valvular problems for this case. Mm -hmm. Of course, they might be having valvular problems for an, uh, every other single cases. But I doubt patients like the one I showed you before. Okay, so patients like this that I did only dorsal definition. I didn't do any crooked noses uh, complaints or any functional problems at all. Only, uh, you know, using this um, paramedial lateral osteotomies with that paramedial uh, groove I do with the bovi in the upper lats. Okay, so, so, uh, so that's great. That's the second tip I give you, um, Dr. Cameron. No, I love it. I, I, I still remember with, uh, I often go to Dallas and visit Rod and Spencer, and Spencer specifically, he uses the bovi quite a lot in rhinoplasty. He's not as, as afraid to, to use it in various different parts of the cartilage in the nose. I think it's a really cool trick to learn. And it is master. cool. And, and sorry if I interrupt you, but I actually got it from him. So my tip is not using the bovi. I know he uses it, and not a lot of people are using it. And actually, I don't do dissection with the bovi. Also, I don't open the nose with the bovi. I'm kind of scared about that still. But uh, I'm shaving my cartilage. Even yeah. my, I'm not doing uh, any cephalic trimming. I'm normally doing cephalic correction. Just you know those borders that are not completely straight, and that's been helping me a lot with the bovi. Okay, G gaining symmetry. Not only in the cephalic aspect of the lateral cruise, but also in the caudal aspect of the lateral cruise, you know, this takeoff angle thing we're talking about. And not only for yeah. um, vertical you know, um, mouth position, but also for uh, nostril symmetry. So I'm using Bovi a lot for that. That's cool. Awesome. Well, that's two down, two more to go, eh? Two more to go, yeah. So this is another interesting topic, okay? So satellite extender grafts, there's been a lot. Tears, rod, banner, uh, traditional lateral uh, spreader grafts, um, terminal spread, I'm um, sorry, extender grafts, like the Yumi says. So everything, I use every one of them, okay? So I've been using a lot of lateral um, septal extender grafts. That's the one I use the most, because I don't know if you agree with me, but most caudal aspects of the, uh, of the septum are not completely straight. So I make them straight with the lateral um, septal extender graft. But whenever I find a completely straight um, dorsal uh, border or caudal border, I'm sorry, of that cartilage, I use um, terminal or um, extended extender, uh, septal extender graft. But still, there were patients that were showing, okay, front views with noses twisted to one side and base views with noses twisted to the other side. So I was saying, you know what? I just can't use lateral. I just can't use terminal. I can't use ANSA or TS rod because I, I am, those kind of struts don't help you controlling the columella show. They usually give you retracted columella and stuff like that. So I was saying, well, I have to do a subtotal septectomy or I, have to, I should de-insert um, the septum from the spine you know, those are maneuvers a little bit more aggressive. And I was saying, why don't I think a little bit more, or, or why don't I think a little bit further? So I was saying, you know what, let me try something else. And actually this happened just by a, a casualty, okay? It, it, it didn't happen because I thought about that. Of the interlocking spreader graft, okay? Sorry for the music. But take a close look. I was harvesting my septum, okay, for grafting. But the thing is that in Latin American people, this septum is not that big. Mm. So I told you before, I'm using a lot of shield grafts. But if you mm -hmm. see, if in a small septum or a small graft, I'm taking shield grafts from one side or the other, my my whole structure is smaller, okay? And I have less grafting for that septal extender graft I was having. So mm. I started thinking, why don't I take the shield graft, not from the edges, but from of that graft. Okay, sorry for that. So take a close. Where I was starting to use, or to take, I'm sorry, that uh, shield graft, 
from those kind of patients that didn't have a lot of septum or cartilaginous septum and see how I cut my shield breath, okay? I just do a harvesting in the mid part of the septal extender graph. So I was getting this, okay? This is something you can put lateral, definitely. This is something a little bit more difficult if you wanna put it end to end, okay? But still, I was doing 90% lateral, so it worked for me a lot. But after that, I was saying, you know what? In some selected patients, I'm gonna show you pictures, okay? This graft can be placed interlocked. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. One side is going to one, one quarter or one edge, yeah. so la maybe lateral in one side of the uh, septum, and the other was going in the other side, okay? So okay. you end is not used in every single patient. There's very specific patients that can be used, okay? But still works, okay? It's an alternative yeah. for the end-to-end -end or to the lateral sexual syndrome. So in which cases is it working, okay? So look at this. So you see, upper end of that nose of the base view is going to the right side. Lower end is going to the left side. So if I put the interlock side, okay, the base interlock side in the right side, and the upper part of that interlock side in the left side, I'm correcting completely that crooked nose, aren't I? That's very interesting, eh? It's making the big nostril, the right side nostril, smaller. That gives symmetry. Yeah. But still, yeah. that tip that's going to the right side, it's coming to the center. I don't have to do any subtotal septectomy or extracorporeal septoplasty. I don't have to de-insert that caudal border from the spine. I'm just placing that septal extender graft specifically as it's go as it, it, it it's asking me to put it. Okay, so it's an interesting maneuver. Not every patient is like this, of course. Okay, of but course. in selected cases, it's, it's work. It works very, 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 very good. Okay, so that's in primary cases. But look at this. Okay, look at secondary cases. I did exactly the same thing but with red cartilage, okay? I interlocked the lower part of the septal extender graph in the right nostril, but the upper part in the left part of the, sit, the tip, okay? So it, make it made it more symmetric and also even straighter, okay? And it works, I think, very well, okay? Very selective cases, but it works very, very good, okay? So that's the third tip. I don't know if you have any 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 anything to okay, say. No, yes. Yeah, I think it's great. It's great to have a tool to use. Out of a hundred patients, you're putting a septal extension graft, and how many of them are you using this technique? One. There we go. <laughs> but okay. like, if it works, it's perfect for that case. You know. Something you you have to have in mind. Okay, so I'm using one in the interlock fashion. Mm -hmm. But since my 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 population is more I'm very you know mestizo doses, mm -hmm. actually I don't have a lot of uh, graft to use. So I'm taking Absolutely. the shield graft from the middle of that graft of that complete uh, septum, but I'm not placing it interlocked. I'm placing it side to side. Okay, yeah. that I you that I do a lot. Maybe 90 out of 100 patients. Then one in 100 patients I interlock it. And the other eight patients or nine patients, I'm sorry, I do it end to end because not yes. everybody has a very straight caudal border of the septum. Yes, yes, that's you know what I mean. So I have the I three, it. the three instruments, the, the, those three, you know, uh, ways of uh, having my mind set up to make it not only better but even faster. Okay, to do rhinoplasty. Okay, slight uh, kind of detour here. Columella strut crops. How often are you using columella strut crops? Only, only, only in this kind of secondary cases that I love projection, that I love rotation, that I love symmetry, and I only need to do tip definition. Okay? Yeah. In those cases, I put a little columella strut. I open whatever she had before, just a little groove. I put the columella strut to give extra support, okay? And after that, I do a shield graft, cap graft, back graft, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in very, very little a number of cases. Maybe out of 100 reconstructive surgeries or revision rhinoplasties, I do one every out of 100. It is not that I don't use it. I used it yesterday in my first revision case. Okay, 
she was actually very good so i just placed it a little bit lateral not in the mid part okay i placed it in the right side so i could make that columella wider in the right side it would and it could help me gain a little bit more nostril symmetry but but still i don't use it a lot because i just try to uh, i just um trust much the septus undergraft and i got used to feeling a tip very strong you know what i mean yeah, yeah. okay uh, you got the fourth thing but i just want to interrupt for a second so Galdurma have brought us this month, and last week I gave a talk at the South African Aesthetics Meeting about liquid rhinoplasty. Give me three things about liquid rhinoplasty. Well, I I do like liquid rhinoplasty, rhino modeling, how they call it. Um, my wife does herself rhino modeling. Okay, it is not that she puts um, hyaluronic acid on herself. But she goes to the dermatologist and she does it for her. Okay, mm -hmm. she has a very thin skin. Her problems are, are minor. Okay, so she's not up to doing a rhinoplasty. And I, I could say, after being 13 years in practice, her problem is very, very little. Okay, that makes the her surgery even harder. And as hyaluronic acid works perfect. So, mm -hmm. you know, the nose actually doesn't has doesn't have a lot of muscle. So as hyaluronic acid doesn't last less than one year. But on the country, she's bad. I think the last time she put it was five years ago, and she still looks good. So, um, it, it is not that I don't agree, but most of my patients have mestizoidosis, thick skin. Okay, they are having liquid rhinoplasty, and then thick skin it just make it thicker. Okay, yeah. whenever they come to me to have surgery, so the that thick skin that's usually a problem i think maybe the biggest problem after handling or reconstruction um now it has another problem added to it that is a random modeling by liquid rhinoplasty so yes in thin skin okay it knows it's a don't need um you know a reduction but it need augmenting uh, it works perfect maybe some people that that have a little hump but not because of the hump but because of a low radix it works incredible okay Thin-skinned people that only need a little bit of tip rotation or tip projection works perfectly. I love it. Yeah, yeah. But that's not my my main, you know, my main number of patients consult in my practice. No, you're on a cut, man. You're on a cut. Okay. Tell us what's the fourth tip. So the fourth tip is a shield graft. Okay. As you know, Cameron, uh, a lot of people use it. A lot of people hate it. Okay. There's a lot about skeletonization in thin skin. There's a lot about uh, making noses look uh, alike in between each other using the shield graft. So let's say, you know, um, I have a lot of thick skin. So I got used to the shield graft on thick skin, okay? What if I use that exoskeletal or that shield graft not only for the tip definition, but also for tip symmetry? And we're gonna go to another animation. So I do my traditional Kowalanski um, transdermal sutures. I do my interdermal sutures a lot of like body shaker does it in the polygon uh, theory. I do my infra tip suture and then I place my shield graft. Okay. So mm -hmm. first problem about shield grafting: over rotation. You know, whenever you put a shield graft and you put the skin over it. It over rotates and it looks yeah. awful, doesn't it? So look at what I'm what I'm doing with the bovi. I'm doing with the bovi a small groove, okay? And after doing that groove, I'm stitching the inferior aspect of that shield graft to the septal extender graft. So I'm derotating that shield graft somehow, aren't I? Okay. I'm also giving it more fixation. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So the other thing I'm using the shield graft is that because I have a heart structure, look at those two stitches I'm putting in the domes, okay? So whenever I have asymmetrical domes, they are not in the same height, the shield graft is helping me, you know, organize them. It's making me, maybe if the left side or the right side is lower, it's helping me to manage putting them in exactly the same position. That's not only gonna help me in tip definition and tip symmetry, but that's also going to help me in nostril symmetry, not only in the base view, but also in the front view, because it's also going to correct lateral cruise retraction and malposition. It is not 
correcting my position by itself, but it's making it symmetrical. And I don't know if you agree with me, but whenever you see maybe a little bit of retraction in the lateral aspect of your nose, but that retraction is completely symmetrical, you feel like not touching that nose. That nose looks great. Okay, a little bit of retraction, it's symmetrical. It looks nice, okay? It's not perfect, theoretical uh, speaking, but it looks great. So that shoe graph is helping me a lot doing the valve plasty and doing symmetry in the lateral aspect of the cruise. So look at this. So this is the kind of cases I was wondering. Huge malposition, okay? So are you using... Me, uh, he didn't invent it, but he were, talks about that a lot. Lateral cruise rate positioning and stuff like that. Or, as body Chakir says, do a better resting angle with your transdomal sutures, with the intradomal sutures. But after my theory of using this kind of shield, that shield grafting is helping me raise the caudal aspect of the lateral cruise and lower aspect of the lateral cruise and by raising that little caudal aspect you're supporting the ailer rim and you're getting better results so it, helping you you know do the mathematical of the, of the mathematics i'm sorry of rhinoplasty so it works very good i can shape that <laughs> shield graph look at this i i made a, 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 a i made a wrong in this case, why? I didn't keep that divergence very well. I, I closed it too much with the POV. So uh, maybe um, too much tip definition. Sorry for that. Okay. But she's great. She feels comfortable. And it's another instrument to use when fixing this kind of problems. Lateral cruise my position and lateral cruise, you know, uh, lack of a support of that lateral wall. Okay. So, so speaking sorry, about sorry, that, let, 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 let me just interrupt you for a second. So you didn't reposition the lateral. I didn't reposition. Not at all. Okay, she was a primary rhinoplasty. She had her cartilage intact. Her cartilage had a nice, nice, nice um, uh, strength. Nice, nice, nice. Um, you know, integrity. They were only a little bit collapsed in the caudal aspect. And, and, and uh, they have a lot of support in this phallic aspect. So um, what we did is we're, we just changed the anatomy. And just like body circuit says, you know, just don't be that um, aggressive in, in working with the tip cartilage. Just try to make them better, yes. maybe um, in topography somehow, and make it look better. And another thing, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about shield crafting and what we were talking about using the bovi so look at this picture i'm gonna show you right now hold on a second i'm gonna show you to you some pictures i have about um okay so if you have a very thick skin you can use your shield graft in one way but if you have very thin skin you can use a bovi and just mm. you know carve it as you want Okay, mm -hmm. just make it softer. And even better, if you have a very contracted skin, you know, secondary cases, thin skin, yes. scar contractor yes. going on, why not, why not, you camouflage that shield grafting, okay? So yeah. we know that in, in, in contracted skin, we need a lot of support. Secondary, we need a lot of support. But the scar tissue and scar contraction is going to skeletonize everything. So just camouflage that shield graft. You have a lot of structure. You have to 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 you know to anchor everything, but you can also you know camouflage it. Why not? As everybody does. You yeah. know what I mean? Hello. Yeah, I'm I'm here. I'm just kind of watching a master operate. There. It's fantastic. So I'm gonna show you another video. That's the last video for the shield grafting. So okay. there's still. Thick skin patients, whenever you use this kind of shield graft, you don't carve anything. You want very, very straight angles. You want, you know, the shield graft to show because you know that thick skin is never going to show it. So what I do, this is a guy your own technique, okay? It's I just not only camouflage my shield graft, but I also attach, I'm sorry, I also attach that shield graft. 
to wherever my patent gay ligament was insert, inserted in this mask. So take a look about that. So I'm doing all the stitches in the shield graft I told you before. I take a close look at this. And just placing it wherever I want. And that's giving me super tip break. And that's yeah. somehow making the thick skin bend wherever I want it to bend. Super tip break and infra tip break. So I get better tip definition. Right. So well, that's oh talking about that fourth tip, Dr. Cameron. And that's it. Brilliant. Thank you. Beautiful. Oh, that's great. So you can you can stop the share of that screen as well. So um, I don't know if you have any any comments that have come in from from your side on Instagram. Well, I haven't had the time to read them all. Okay, yeah. I'm just gonna ask them anything to, to see if there's a question popping out. Of course. Eh, si tienen alguna pregunta técnica que podamos compartir con el doctor Cameron desde Sudáfrica de lo que pudieron ver aquí en, en el Instagram en vivo, yo sé que, que no es lo típico que vemos en, en, en conferencias en línea, pero si tienen alguna pregunta, por favor háganosla saber. Doctor Cameron, do you have any any questions at all? People around you have any questions? No, I, I, I'm not going to listen to their questions. But I, I want to ask you more questions, dude. I want to ask you when you're coming to South Africa, man. <laughs> Whenever you invite me, please ask me. I am think I'm going next year to Iraq to do surgeries, Pakistan yeah. doing surgeries. Awesome. So I do a lot of live surgeries. If you want to come yeah. to Cartagena, we do. I, I I don't represent, but I work a lot for for SAPS. Okay, SAPS is for me yeah. my 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 home. Okay, South American Plastic Surgery Meeting. We've been having Jose Carlos Neves, Pablo Casas. We have invited Sureya, Emre. They're coming next year. So if you want to come and do a live surgery, you please just tell me, and you'll gonna you'll be my guest. Okay. Yeah, we've we've got our live surgeries coming up in a few weeks. We've got Sam Most coming out in Volvcon, um, which is going to be cool. And uh, I must tell you one story from my side. You know, I've been to Caracas, Venezuela. So it's, you've it's been here, funny, yeah, bro. So this is quite a funny story. It's way back. Then. It was it was before the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. So I, I was training, and I was absolutely clueless. I, it's quite embarrassing to this story, but. It's, Anyway, I have to tell you. So I was in Austria, training with the Austrian Olympic team. And they said to me, Cam, they're going to go and train in Costa Rica and I must come with them. So I was like, well, I've got to get a flight. So I went to the travel agent and knew this is 1995. Like, no internet stuff like that. So the lady said she fly, they only fly to Puerto Rica. They don't fly to Costa Rica. And I thought, like, I'm 20. What do I know? It's the same place. All those little countries in South America, I'm just going to fly. And I arrived there and I heard Spanish for the first time in my life. And uh, I go to the information and I say, listen, I want to go get a bus. I want to go to Costa Rica. And this lady starts laughing at me and she shows me a map of the world. And I realize I'm 2,000 kilometers away in the middle of the ocean. Anyway, I had to get a connecting flight that stopped all the way. And one of the places we stopped at was Caracas in Venezuela. And I remember just looking out the window and then we flew on further. But uh, it was, yeah, that was in another life, eh? So, so you were in Costa Rica for the beaches, for surfing, for lecturing? What, what were you doing? No, for kayaking. I was training very hard. Oh, come on, surfing. come on. You should yeah. come to do kayaking here in Los Roques, okay? So actually, yeah. it's it's like, a, we call it an archipelago. It's like a, like a Fiji yeah. or like Bora Bora or like whatever. And yeah. and it's got best wind of them all, okay? People love doing kite surfing. There's another coast here called um, Adikora. It works as well because... Um, yeah. It's also for windsurfing, but if you do kayaking, it works a lot because in Los Roques, there's no waves at all because it's all in between small islands. Okay, yeah, you yeah. could go maybe, I don't know, 100 kilometers kayaking and, and it works wow. It works lovely, okay? You can also do um, um, freshwater or um, river kayaking. We have the Orinoco and stuff like that. It works yeah. It works incredible. It, it's, it's kind of an amazing place to come to. I still, we're still working out the political situations. I don't want to say things are getting better, but it stopped getting worse. So well, somehow, good, I, yeah. yeah, that that it's yeah. it's just. I think things are working out. We just closed relationships to Colombia, so it worked out for me as well. 
And um, I, when I mean close, is it not that we, we stopped having a relationship? We stopped that years ago on the 28th of this month. They're opening the borders and opening everything. We're bonding back together with Colombia. And, and you should come. You should come. Whenever you want to come to Venezuela as well, please be my guest. Come to Bogota, be my guest. But please, please invite me to South Africa and I'll be Safari. there. You see all the animals behind me. It's going to be cool. <laughs> it's going to be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, from my side, uh, and this brings us to the end of our second last episode of the Rhino Plastic Podcast for season two. Next week, I've got one of the other rock stars from South America in Maria Ferraz. So, come and listen to a cool interview we did with him. And I just want to give a shout out to Gal Derma again for um, enabling this. Thank you very much. And, and a shout out to all the listeners from around the world. Guys, we really appreciate you coming every week to listen. We, it's so nice to get the comments that I do from literally countries all over the globe. And and then my final thank you is to Freelan. Freelan, I really appreciate you taking more than an hour and a half out of your day to share this knowledge. It's it's fantastic. And thank you very much. And, you know, I'm super proud of what you're doing as one of the young guns around the world at the moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Cameron. Send my regards to Mario Ferraz. I'm going to be with him giving lectures in Bolivia in two weeks. So awesome. uh, we'll talk about you and we'll share everything. I'm giving, I'm giving you a call, video call, and uh, and we'll send our regards to you as well. Awesome, guys. So listen, listeners, go make it, make it happen. Hey, guys, do your best in rhinoplasty and uh, keep improving. We, we've got a really cool speciality that we do. Thank you so much, Dr. Cameron. Bye-bye. Cool, man. Bye.